All right, the Reds, it's the most depressing day of the year, apparently, for the rest of the nation, but Liverpool are top of the league by four points, and it's near the end of January, so what's depressing about that? Absolutely not, and Liverpool are boss, they're still boss, uh, they nearly fucked it up, but they didn't, and they won, uh, so we should all be happy, I'm happy, are you happy, Rob? Yeah, I, actually, I now realise why I'm slightly depressed as well. Because it's, it's most depressing. Blue Monday, yeah. Blue Monday, oh, Allegedly. Yeah, yeah. Well, the Reds but uh, the Samaritans are turning it into Brew Monday. And apparently, instead of being depressed, just go to your mate and say, fancy a brew, lad, and have a brew with them, and it'll cheers you up. And I walked in this morning, and Sam bought me a brew. It's like he knew. What a guy. So I'm happy. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm happy. We're Rob, Rob Gutman, Paul Cope with me, by the way, to discuss, uh, to discuss this match and just generally have a bit of a chat. Um, do, do you know what I'm noticing, though? You know, City are following our games at the moment, mm -hmm. which is good because we're putting pressure on them, we're winning. The so you, then you settle the second part of your weekend to watch City or follow their game. Uh, and they slightly ruin the weekend, do you know what I mean? Just take a little edge off, the little shy. Or just feel that. I know, I still wish it would be the other way around, that they'd won their, their game on the... Imagine how good we'd feel knowing we had to win because City had won theirs. But, and this is one of the things I was going to raise as a talking point, Liverpool are the best side in the league at beating hey. the rest oh. of the league. Yeah. Um, I mean, not only we top, but against, yes. the, against the rest of the teams outside of the, uh, the, the, the big six, if you want to call it that. Some people do, some people don't. Um, Liverpool have played 16, won 16, drawn none, lost none. Uh, 41 goals for, six goals against 48 points. Uh, the nearest uh, to us in terms of that particular mini-league, if you like, is City. But they've played one more and they've only managed 43 points. So Liverpool, in general, are... Uh, for want of a better phrase, beating the shite on a regular basis. And, um, well, Palace weren't shite, but they beat them again, and here we are, we're still top. Yeah. Maybe the end of January. Yeah, it's one of those things, isn't it? The show's all like all the old stuff of the past is slowly Gone. disappearing. Yeah. And the, the sooner we get onto that, the better. I think I think most people are getting onto that a bit more now, aren't they? And not, not panicking so much. We were saying before we started recording that we conceded the goal from a corner there and got Ferdinand going on about all this shit, but when was the last time we conceded a goal from a corner? That, that, that's a, the fact that that's a rare event now. And it was now, a foul. And it was a foul, as we've discussed. I mean, I can't believe more... Well, I can believe more hasn't been made of it, because we seem to be the... Uh, this, there's this weird thing going on in the country at the moment, isn't it? Half the people think we're the darlings of the press, and but I'm going, well, how, how can we be? No one's even mentioned that. Everyone's getting on Salah's back. So, yeah, like... So what? But it's it's incredible. That record is incredible. Yeah. Imagine if someone had said at the start of the season, that's what we're going to do. But we're this going to destroy all these yeah. other teams. And th th this is sort of why, if if you haven't seen it, I'm going to write a piece about it today. So so that'll be on the site later. But Rio Ferdinand is in the studio of, of BT Sport, and he's asked about sort of what he makes of the results, mm. Liverpool's results. And he starts going like, you know, goes all sincere and really serious and says, you know, Liverpool have conceded from a set piece, conceded three goals. And he said, when you're doing that and when, when that happens, all of a sudden you think, oh, they're going to catch us. And it's kind of based on what? Because as we keep saying, I know you've brought it up before, sort of the roll and points thing, now Andrew Beasley does and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah. We've been playing well for over a calendar year. Yeah. So why, why would we suddenly suspect that, you know, just because there's a... We've won, we've won the game as well, we haven't even lost. But yeah. just because we can see three goals, all of a sudden Everton's going to fall apart. It doesn't really, doesn't really add up, particularly when two people in the defence ordinarily wouldn't be there if, if everyone was fit in, in terms of Milner and um, Matic. Yeah. So, you know, it was a bit of a makeshift makeshift defence. We've said that already that we think there was a foul on, on on at least one of the goals as well. So this idea that we should kind of be worried after that, I, I, I'm more the other way in that Klopp said after the game, I don't know how many ways there are to win a football game, but we seem to have had a few of them already. And he's right, isn't he? That, that was just another way that you clock up three points and surely a bit of a hallmark of champions. Yeah, it was. I mean, and it's a, it's a four-two game at one point, and you know, just as likely that we run away and score a, a fluky fifth as as they get that that goal. I mean, their third goal, which makes it look like we've had a bad day defensively, is a total knockoff by Al. That's. I have to say, if I got them back and I'm being Klopp and I'm trying to you know keep them on their toes, I'm going mad about that third yeah. goal. It was a real knockoff. All and Jordan Shakiri are just watching him, just 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 banging in there. And, and Allison should have got a stronger hand to it as well. But yeah. ev everybody's knocked off on that one. I've watched I watched the whole game back in, in, to in total. And what's interesting is Palace get three goals, but they're not really in the game as an attacking mm. force. They are they are they, you know they have their potency. They have Zaha and they. And uh, they, they do come out and their first goal is an incredible example of if you can beat the press, 
then yeah. the riches can be there for you. But they're very lucky to get out of that press. It's a brilliant piece of passage played by Liverpool. And somehow, I can't remember the lad in midfield, is it McCarthy? McCarthy, McCarthy, yeah. he gets McCarthy. it out of his feet and he just switches. He doesn't know where he's switching it to. And suddenly, suddenly the lad breaking down the left, I think, is it Zahar? Zahar against Zahar. Milner. Well, yeah, yeah before he's got, he's got freedom at the park. Um, but, it, you know, as I said, the second goal is, is, is what makes it look like a bit of a mad game. And, it's a, it, and I thought afterwards, well, how the hell does anyone get a free header in our six-yard box when we've got Virgil there? Did he go off the field for five minutes streaming? I'd, I'd have missed something. And then you watch it back. He's just holding it, the other lad's holding him down. End of. And it's a good header. And it's a decent header, but Virgil's, you can see his position, he's just going to nick that away routinely. Well, and it, he, misses, he actually misses the header by about an inch. Yeah. So it, he would Even have reached it with, with being held. Bring Well, it was funny on, on the <laughs> thing about him. Start a, start a whole different conversation, that wouldn't it? On the, on the thing about beating the press, I saw people tweeting about it, like, this is how you beat Liverpool's press. It's not that simple, lads. Because no. at the no. end of the day, most other teams don't have a Zaha in their team. And usually, we don't have a 50-year-old right-back playing against Zaha. Like, all of these things, when, when Fer I think Ferdinand's making a bit of a fool of himself with his comments. Because if that's Trent playing right back... Who's been playing well on the sly, by the way. Yeah, and he, he's got all the pace in the world. He's played the plane. Don't get me wrong, he's had, he's had nightmares earlier on in his career against fast wingers, but he's learnt from them. Mm. I've, play, I've seen Trent play Leroy Sané and be absolutely fantastic. So Zaha against Trent in that position would be completely different. And the other side of it as well is, even I was thinking about this afterwards, we, you leave that game going, God, Milner's had a tough day at the office there, hasn't he? He's good going the other way. But I, well, that as well. But only one of the three goals came from there. One was a corner, and one was from the other side anyway, mm. wasn't it? So and, and the red is because he sold short on the pass, and he knows. Oh, I mean, and, yeah. The, I was thinking after that, like uh, Henderson did a whole different conversation. I thought he was great. Played but well. That, perfect, like, there should be a way of being able to say, "I'll take that yellow. That's my yellow. That that's not his fault. Yeah. That was an awful pass." The perfection required for them to score that goal to, to beat our system yeah. is um, you have every single little event in there has to go their way because if they get any one thing wrong, we probably score because we're pressing with four or five yeah. lads and doing it well. Yeah. And the one lad gets out of his feet while he's got four around him. You think if you do, the next movement, if you get that wrong, we're in. Yeah. He gets a half a yard right, and then even the next fellow is McCarthy. It has to be perfect. I well, don't think he even looks, and he finds his man. everything. And, and that's the thing the as well, back. isn't it, about sort of, you know, the, almost like the over-analysis of football at times. So on that, you know, you can see people discussing it, saying, oh, Liverpool have fucked up there, Liverpool have got it wrong. They were following the manager's instructions to the letter. There's yep. three or four of them round the defensive player, trying to win the ball back high up the pitch, which Liverpool most times do. Yep. That's where they win loads of the ball. When you look at heat maps and where they win possession and all that sort of stuff, it's high up the pitch. So they were doing what the manager wanted them to do. They got caught. A good player was up against Milner. Milner's not a right back. Milner's not that fast. So Haas, one of the fastest players in the league. Mm. He's not daft. He sets up a goal, they score. I mean, just to, before we go to Neil, and Neil's going to get into some of the, the tactical stuff as usual with the tactics board, uh, we haven't done the stats yet. We know when we start with this. So obviously, Liverpool won 4 3, you know that one, but in terms of expected goals, uh, Liverpool's was 2.38, Palace's was 0.81. Um, Liverpool had 20 shots to Palace's 9. Uh, nine of those were on target, three of Palace's were on target, i.e. the goals. 71% um, possession for Liverpool, 87% pass completion for Liverpool. Um, and all the way through, um, it looks pretty impressive. What, what is interesting is we started to use a, a site called Stats Bomb, and we're going to be using them a lot more as we go on. Uh, Neil is planning uh, a show which is pretty much all going to be all about the stats. Uh, that, that will be the video project that's coming soon. Um, but using stats one, they, they collate something called uh, pressures, which is interesting. And uh, it, pressing it's, effectively, it's, it's essentially pressing. Yeah, and yeah. Um, you know, Palace won through pressures, two hundred and ten. Well, Palace did two hundred and ten pressures, and Liverpool did one hundred and thirty-two. Uh, Liverpool pressure regains twenty-nine to Palace's forty-one. Uh, but Liverpool also won uh, 22 of 35 tackles attempted. Palace won 20 out of 30. Um, before we sort of dissect that a little bit, then let's let's go full on stats. Let's go full on tactics. Here's Neil Atkinson. So the quiet game we expected, the control of Liverpool and Crystal Palace with their fourth highest number of clean sheets within the Premier League. It wasn't what we got. That's the way in which it goes sometimes. Football matches get out of control. How they got out of control is really, really interesting. 
Kite has got nice pressing numbers, it's fair to say. He was looking to push back and might have been doing a fair bit of unseen work, but he wasn't terrific on the ball. I think we can all acknowledge that. One of the things that I thought was interesting from Palace was they were really, really narrow. If you go through the average position of influence on the pitch, it was narrower than you might think. And even right the way up in the attack, it was narrower than I expected. One of the things I observed as the game wore on was to me, I felt as though Zaha and Townsend were cheating a little bit and IU was doing a lot of running, a lot of their work for them really, impressing Liverpool and he was right the way up there. These two I thought were cheating in these sorts of areas, looking to hang on coming alive either centrally and then looking to spark out. Townsend comes from the right to get his goal all the way over there after Zaha's come right the way down there. I think this is the way in which Crystal Palace looked to do it. It was three attackers and then a really narrow four. What that led to was Milner right the way up the pitch, was Robertson right the way up the pitch. Milner gets his goal, making the pitch huge. And you see that Zaha's not really aware of it on the cover. He notices it's too late. Van Arnold can't get there. And when Milner knocks it back across the goal, for Salah to follow in, it happens in this sort of area. Because Liverpool, it's these two players who are making the pitch absolutely enormous and wide. And so it almost at times resembles almost 2 3 5, to be honest with you, where the two back two, then you've got the Fabinho Henderson axis, and then you've got this. But what Palace did quite well, and the flip side of Zaha not being const constantly on the cover, is he's able to cheat and hurt Liverpool when the, when the ball breaks. And when Liverpool all pressed around this area of the pitch, and Palace got themselves out at one point in the game, the reason why they were able to in the way in which they did and they had all that space for the opening goal was because Liverpool had overcommitted there but Zaha and Townsend hadn't been rushing back to help out. Zaha was on this flank but even Townsend's not coming and offering MacArthur a little ball really. He then gets himself up the pitch and arrives. I think that shows that that was what was in Palace's mind in terms of taking a couple of risks while simultaneously defending with seven at the back and as I said before, are you doing all the work? It became a mad game of football, these things happen. Liverpool brought Shaqiri on, he didn't do a great deal. They had to solve the problem as to what happens when they go down to 10. Uh, it ended up being Bobby Firmino all the way back to right back as James Milner comes off the pitch. I've quite enjoyed doing that, to be honest with you, with the little counters. Uh, that's one of the things that happened during the game. The last little thing that I wanted to talk about was how often almost everyone was almost over on this side of the pitch. You know, at times you could have drawn a line through the middle of the pitch and I thought it was noticeable that you know, there might have been Robertson, perhaps Townsend maybe, might have been around there, but the, the play compacted itself on Matip and Milner. That was what Palace wanted to do. When Liverpool had it, the pitch was enormous. When Palace had it, the pitch was tiny. It's one of the, it's two different ways to play football. All right, thanks to Neil there. Uh, good job, you don't know what we were just talking about. Uh, anyway, <laughs> um, second half of the show then. Um, Jordan Henderson, the manager, getting in interviewed after the match, and you saw Henderson talk about the fact that he didn't think Liverpool had the control uh, that they normally have of matches. You saw uh, the manager as well, uh, very relieved and talking about uh, how he'd gone straight to Camacho and said to him that he'd made the most important challenge of his life uh, for that very late chance that Palace had where the referee seemed desperate to give them uh, one more chance in front of goal. Uh, Camacho cleaning that one up there. Um, in terms of that, I mean, you know, we mentioned just before the break the sort of stats which overwhelmingly show that Liverpool have the majority of the game, the majority of shots, the majority of the chances, pass the mm. ball better, win the ball better, whatever. So do you, do you agree where Henderson's coming from with the control aspect? Because even he, to be fair, I mean, a lot of people criticise him for sideways and backwards passing yeah. and all that. He was very positive. He was very forward thinking in this match. Is there a case to say that at times Liverpool should have done the control thing a little bit more? I think there, it's weird. I mean, it, it is, we are doing the control thing until, until they score. And when they score, it makes everything you've done before look like you would have had no master plan. Um, yeah, I mean, we were very content. It had echoes of the previous game, uh, Brighton, where Liverpool were very happy to go from side to side, pull them from left to right, and wait for an opportunity. And you could see it maybe having to take to the second half to score first. The fact that they get that counter, that, that goal, that mad goal on the counter, changes everything. But as we said before, you, you know, they had to be perfect to get that goal. We were doing what the manager instructed. Um, any game that looks 4-3 looks like it, it, it lost control. And I suppose you do say it did get a bit wild, but you know, you, you've got to be prepared for different modes, haven't you? Tomorrow, you copy what did you make of it? I think there's um, something I love about footy is the stuff you can't see. I've mentioned before, so everyone loves focusing on what they can see. And I love the I, I love uh, where this has happened loads over the over the past years where a player all of a sudden seems even more important when they're not there. And for ages I've been saying we don't have a controlling midfielder. But I think we really, really missed Genie Wijnaldum. Yeah in that game. You got to see how 
Wait, there are loads of times in a football match when Gino Wijnaldum just gets hold of the ball and doesn't lose it. Just holds it yep. and keeps it. And he's not even passing it, he's just keeping it. And I think there were times in that game where if you'd have just had him on the pitch, it wouldn't have got that chaotic. Um, but I think, I think Rob's right. I think it's, it's dead easy to, to look at the goals conceded and, and to analyse it in a different way. Actually, we, we dominated. Until they scored the first goal, we were in complete control of that match. And I think you can read too much into it. Sometimes you just have games like that, don't we? And it, going back to the third and thing before, it's hilarious. We conceded three goals and we won 4-3. Man City conceded three goals to them and got beat 3-1. So, at the end of the day, we won. And we were Fourth. winning 4-2. If, we'd have, if that game had finished 4-2, there would be none of that sort of analysis, would there? It would be well. I think, it, I think it's interesting as well. And uh, I was talking about this with the cab driver on the way in just then. And, uh, but, like, the Roy Hodgson immediately obviously goes on the defensive like he does. Uh, he's always looking for excuses. He's an excuses man. Yeah. Um, and he, he's talking about uh, Robertson's handball in the in the lead up to, to Mane's goal. Yeah. Now, I think no one sees that in the ground at the time. The linesman's absolutely miles away from it. The ref's miles away from it. You see one Palace defender raising his hand saying he's handballed it as, it as it's unfolding. And then when it goes in the back of the net, he's running to the referee and saying yeah. there's a handball in the build-up. Obviously, he then goes in the changing room, tells Roy Hodgson, and he's like, oh, great. I've got something that I can rely on. What was interesting, I don't know if you've seen Match of the Day, Danny Murphy was talking about it. And they've shown it. But Is it a clear handball? I've not seen it. He puts his arm out like that, yeah, and he just sort of yeah. gives it a bit of a nudge, right, and, okay. and then he keeps it in. It's a great it? handball. Yeah. But Danny Murphy says, with the benefit of the studio, the cameras, the staff, that match of the day, and everything else, it took them a while to find it. Mm. So it's not like it's this blatant handball and the really hard ones. No. So, I mean, we can say that Liverpool get a little bit lucky in terms of what the goalie's doing on one of the, at least one of the goals, in terms of that not being seen and things like that. But there's a little bit of a. You know, it's a cliche, up. but it's the, it, the, no, it's the making your own look thing as well, though, because Robertson's so determined to drive Liverpool on at that point, sliding in to keep it in on the line, a bit McMahon-esque against Arsenal yeah. that time and that kind of thing. And it's like, you, you sort of made your own look a little bit on that one, I think. Yeah, and it's, I know it's in the build-up to the goal, but it is still early enough. It, it's not like it's the, the key manoeuvre in that goal. Yeah. It's a bit sliding doors. You can you could keep rewinding football matches and go, tell what about you what, this? There was, yeah. yeah, there was a little... You could go, let's go back a further 20 seconds until you find an injustice. Now, I know it is. Without that handball, that goal doesn't happen. There's also a number of other things that are needed to make that goal. In fact, there's five or six other touches required, including a superb finish by Marnie. You know, if somebody... Uh, Somebody trips somebody, somebody and the ref doesn't see it and then Gerard five years ago bangs one in from 30 yards. You don't go, well, I'll tell you what, that was a piece of luck. You know, yeah. it still took an incredible amount of ingenuity. And you know, that's a game of, uh, of, but they had this, we had that, isn't it? And we talked about the Van Dyke one. There's, mom there's moments where the, where the keeper drops it. But then again, the, you know, their first goal is a fantastic goal, but, but, but they need fortune all the way through it. It's, that's, if ever you want to see a game where you talk about football's a game of... A huge game of luck, but it's how you react to those moments of chance. Well, also as well, it, it, again, it's too basic, which is typical Roy, to, to effectively go, well, if that hadn't happened, we'd have drawn 3-3. Three, three. But that isn't what would have happened. Because no, no as soon as we go, yeah, yeah, and as soon as we go 4-2 up, the, everyone relaxes. Don't they don't we? knock off. It's like, oh, that's it now. We've, we've won, yeah. it's 4-2. Everyone knocks off. If it's 3-2 with five minutes left, it's a completely different game. Yeah. We don't knock off at all. Everyone's into every challenge. The, the amount of space they have to put that cross in, lay one off, and then for that lad to take the, the finish he does, I just don't think that happens if it's 3-2 with five minutes left. No. no. Uh, the only other thing I wanted to get you on then before we end the show is um, an, another thing I quite like on this Stats Bomb website. And, you know, check it out, have a look. Uh, we've teamed up with them now and we're going to be doing lots of stuff with them, as I say. Is, is just the way they lay out um, the, the future fi fixtures to come, if you like. The way they've done it, uh, which is quite nice. Don't ever Sam will be able to flash this up on the screen. We'll see. But they've done it so that you can basically see. It, it shows you the league in order, and then it's showing you who you've still got to play next to it, if you like. And so it's a really simple way of um, going, OK, well, they're a good team, and we've still got to play them, if you know what I mean. So, like, Liverpool's fixtures are laid out this way, and you can see that we've still got Tottenham and Chelsea at home. We've got Watford, Wolverhampton and Leicester at home. We've got Bournemouth at home, Burnley at home, and Huddersfield at home. Um, in, in terms of... And when you look at City, they've got they've got Tottenham at home, Chelsea at home, Arsenal at home, Watford at home, Leicester at home, West Ham at home, Cardiff at home, and then they've got United away, 
They've got Everton away, Bournemouth away, Brighton away, Palace away, Burnley away, Newcastle away, and Fulham away. And now, Rob, I know you're experts on these kind of things, am, and you've I been am. you've been looking yeah. through these loads. What what do you make of the of, of the two fixture lists that are left compared to I'll side you, by side? I'll tell you, Gareth, because I have been looking at it over and over. I'm not doing much else with my life at the moment, but looking at these <laughs> fixture lists. Um, Actually, before the before City play at Huddersfield yesterday, we had two home games in hand on them. We've got a we've got a home game in hand on them, and we've got a, a game less against the top six in hand on them. Mm -hmm. I've I, I put that through the computer and I've crunched it. <laughs> yeah. and I, I reckon it's worth. In all seriousness, I reckon it's worth. If you statistically looked at the odds of the results, I think it's worth at least two points to us that on our current. So our current leader four is a slightly false low one. I think it's more like. Simply with the game, with it, well, with those two factors in hand. Yeah. Because, okay, Art City could beat Arsenal, but they won't. They wouldn't beat them every single time they played them at home. They've effectively got to play at Arsenal at home whilst we're playing at a, a bottom side at home, and also they've got to go away. I don't know, away while we play at home. So it, across those two events, they are likelier to drop some points. Yeah. Whilst well, we wouldn't. Uh, well, I was looking just at the next sort of week to two weeks. And even that's fascinating because mm. whilst we're having a lovely rest in Dubai and getting a bit of bit of heat into our bones and recovering, they're playing home against Burnley in the cup. Which whoever they play and whatever, that's not an easy. That's not a, that's not a gimme. I was actually relieved when I saw they had someone like Burnley. I didn't realise. I thought they'd have a, another buy like they've been getting lately. But then the midweek after that, so we've had a rest. They've had a game. They're they're away at Newcastle on the Tuesday night. So they play Saturday and then Tuesday yeah. away at Newcastle. Newcastle have just come into a tiny bit of form and scored mm. some goals. And I think we're home to Leicester, yeah. who are in a bit of a bit of a, a patch, bit of a sticky situation. And then the weekend after that. So again, their games are coming thick and fast, whereas we've had a bit of a breather. They've got Arsenal, They've got Arsenal at home. Yeah. And, and that's just, like if you'd have said to me a couple of weeks ago, Arsenal, I'd been like, oh, I wish they'd have had them a few weeks ago. But after Arsenal's performance against Chelsea, all of a sudden you think, well, at the very least, it's not an easy game. They're gonna if Arsenal play in the same style with that pressing, City have got a tough game there. Well, so their next three: Newcastle away, Arsenal home, Chelsea home. Yeah, right. I think that these they've got three before the Champions League restarts. Our three are Leicester home, West Ham away, Bournemouth home. Ours look, Big, our, right. ours, look ours look are nearer to being a nine point bankers than theirs do. Yeah. So my fingers crossed we can go into the Champions League phase having extended this lead. Let's see. Well, Rob's not the only one that's crunching these type of things. Obviously, the bookies are at it all the time, and I just thought of the day I'd finish off by saying Liverpool are odds on to win the Premier League title remain so. Uh, Liverpool, uh, sorry, Manchester City, you can get around five to four for them, but the drop off from there is quite amazing. So Tottenham now you can get sort of a hundred to one. Chelsea you can get two fifty. Um, United four hundred. What are we? Eight to thirteen, something like Everton, that. Everton four thousand five hundred to one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, worth fifty p. Um, you can, we're, we're six to four on um, to win it. Right. So, you know, they're crunching the numbers as well. There's a reason for all this. It's because Liverpool are good. If you're having a blue Monday, which it, it's meant to be, have a think about that. This Liverpool side's great. Uh, this has been the second look. Thanks to Robin Copey of the fucking Reds.